Right, welcome everybody. Uh, sorry for the change in dates. I know that affected several of you and your ability to join today, but um, hopefully the recording will go out to those who couldn't make it. Uh, welcome back. It's been a lot longer than normally between calls. I'm hoping to get back on schedule very quick. Uh, but first, a few announcements. Number one, as of today, we are 200 members strong. Just one year ago today, we had 27 members. So huge growth. Great, um, great job everyone inviting others and spreading the word. Um, and from my perspective, the quality of the conversations has improved as we've increased our membership. So way to go, really, really proud of, um, of the growth and I look forward to seeing where we go next. Just, just a little hint, wouldn't it be great if sometime in the next year or so we are able to have some of these conversations face to face, if we get big enough and we get enough people involved, uh, I would love to see us go in that direction. So uh, let's keep growing. Um, on that note, um, you guys did a great job giving me a, a list of topics that you were interested, both through Slack and email and in our last conversation. Next step is to prioritize those topics so that I can order them and schedule out the next uh, you know, five to seven calls. So I will be sending an email soon asking for you to simply tell me on a, you know, whatever scale of one to five or something, your interest level in each of the topics and also your willingness to serve on the panel for those topics. To be clear, with 200 members, even if you're interested, it doesn't mean you'll get to be on that panel every time. I, I do have to, um, you know, make sure that everybody that is interested gets a chance. Um, but I also will give you a space to recommend a panelist, whether it's uh, yourself, a colleague, somebody else in the TLC, or a potential member um, of, for uh, a future member for the TLC. Um, um, please continue to share the TLC community with friends, colleagues through social media, um, share your invites, encourage people to sign, review and sign the code of conduct, um, do it yourself if you haven't already. We have 200 members, but only 150 of you have reviewed and signed the code of conduct, so we do need to increase that number, please. Um, and just to be clear, it's very basic. It just says you're not going to try to sell something to each other, um, that we're here to uh, teach and learn, and that's, um, that's the whole purpose of the community. No solicitation. Um, that's everything. So let's get started with introductions. I believe everyone is on the call. Um, we're going to start with two new members of uh, the TLC in the panel. Um, uh, Matt Policastro is first up. Um, Matt is a data scientist at Clearhead, which is now a part of the Accenture Interactive Group. He has a master's in business analytics. He describes himself as generally affable and affably pedantic. And um, I got to learn about him from the Digital Analytics Power Hour podcast, episode number 89. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to Matt on that podcast, I encourage you to do so because he's a really smart and fun guy. Um, number two, Chad has been a member of the TLC, but this is uh, the first time that he has served on the panel. And again, um, found out about uh, Chad specifically for this topic after listening to the Digital Analytics Power Hour podcast bonus mini episode. So two panelists come to us from the Power Hour podcast. And then, of course, we have the host of the Power podcast, Tim Wilson. So I seem like there's some kind of relationship going on there. So everybody should probably check out both. Um, Chad is the experimentation and personalization manager at Subway Restaurants. Um, he is describes himself as a digital experimentation and quasi-experimental design professional, which is just real easy to say. Um, and I, I'm really glad to have him here. He's also um, been very helpful uh, working with Tim and I on the calculator that you guys are going to get to see today. Um, and then we all know and love our Matt Gershoff. He uh, is the co-founder and CEO of Conductrix, and he has two master's degrees in AI and resource economics, because one just wasn't enough. And as most of the TLC members know, he is a regular because he's just too nice to say no. And uh, he genuinely likes talking about this stuff, and I find he's my phone a friend anytime I have any question about statistics. So thanks for coming back, Matt. 
And then last but not least, uh, my friend, Tim Wilson. Um, Tim is currently the Senior Director of Analytics at Search Discovery. Uh, he is my colleague, and he has the best hair of everybody at Search Discovery and probably everybody on this call. He is the co-host of the Digital Analytics Power Hour uh, with my boss, um, Michael Helbling. Um, and he is the creator of the sample size calculator that we will be looking at today. Um, one of my favorite things about Tim and probably his least favorite thing about me is that uh, he just continues to make constant improvements. And it's maybe because I'm high maintenance and keep coming up with them, but I also think he's just a perfectionist and likes to keep making changes. So thanks, Tim. All right, that is everyone. So welcome and let's just dive in. A quick reminder to everybody on the phone, if you have a question, go off mute, ask your question, or go to the TLC Slack channel if you're a member. Um, go to the TLC calls group or channel within the TLC Slack, ask your question there. And then there's also a chat functionality within the Zoom interface. All of those options are fully available to you and I encourage you to use them. All right, so let's talk sample sizes. Um, first of all, I want, to, I want to kick off the conversation with kind of an important, though it seems basic, question um, about sample size calculations and why they matter. Um, specifically here focused on A-B testing in the, in the marketing world, whether it's website, media, what, whatever, whatever kind of conversion rate optimization or, or testing that we're doing. Why do we need to do sample size calculations? Why do they matter? And I'm just going to go from left to right in our list here and um, to kick off that conversation. And we'll start with Matt. So why are sample sizes important? Yes. Well, uh, I uh, tend to come from a pretty pragmatic perspective, uh, just of a, hey, we want to be able to run these tests in an effective time window. We want to be able to get the results and be able to tell the client what's going on uh, without it being uh, having to say to them, well, it's been running for about six months now, probably looking at another, another six months. We know this is very important to you and your business. Um, and also being able to balance the realistic demands of the business of, hey, we need to keep these tests running. We need to be able to give people results uh, within a reasonable window with a, hey, we are trying to keep give people things that are actually meaningful instead of just watching wild fluctuations that are happening in front of us. Uh, so I am very much a very big fan of a, we calculate the sample size, we calculate the duration of the test, we really try not to touch it as much as possible uh, unless something has gone horribly, horribly awry. Uh, but yeah, sample sizes are our friends, uh, not our enemies. Uh, be nice to them. <laughs> Thanks. Chad? Yeah, so I, I think sample size is important for primarily two reasons. So the first is a statistical issue. It's called power. And, and basically what power means, whatever it's, a, it's expressed as a percentage. So if I have something like 80% power, which is the industry norm, it means that 80% of the time, if there is a true result to be found in the first place, I'm going to be able to detect it. And 20% of the time, even if it exists, I don't detect it. And sample size is a really important key in that power formula. If I don't have the right sample size, I may not have very good power, which means I might be creating tests that are winners, but I don't know that they're winners, which is a waste of everybody's time. And the second thing that's really important is the issue of representation. So one of kind of the, the, the key focuses of experimentation, the things that's really important is that our sample size needs to be representative of our entire group. Right? That's kind of an assumption we make. If it's not representative and we apply that test, then we're risking not seeing the results that we observe because the groups are different. So the more people that we have, and you know, the more time that our test runs for, then the more likely it is that it's going to be representative and the results we get during our experiment will match the results we get after we implement our experiment. Excellent. All right, Mr. Gershoff, I'm going to move to you and I'm, I'm going to change the question up a little bit because I want to make it more challenging. Is there an ever a valid reason to not calculate sample size before your test? Um, well, I mean, you, I, I guess it, it depends on what you're, you're trying to do. Um, so I just want to get back to your, your first question your first question, <clears throat> and then I'll try to answer the second, unless I've, I've rambled on for too long. And, and this is related to what both Matt and Chad were talking about. But the, I mean, the point, of, the point of running a test 
right? As opposed to like estimating, you know, the conversion rate, you're running a test for a reason. And there's, there's really two, two components to the test. You're trying to mitigate your type one error, right? Which is the false positive. And you're trying to mitigate jointly your type two error, right? Which is the false negative, which is what Chad was talking about with the power. That's, that's the reason you're trying to put some sort of guarantees or some sort of in expectation, some sort of bounds on the probability of, of making an error with your decision. And you pay for that with, with your sample, right? And so you can think of sample as, um, as information. So the, the, the more data that you collect, the more information you have. And so the, the whole point of the enterprise is to mitigate those two risks. Right. And so you need to come to the problem, having assessed what your risk appetite is for both of those risks, and then to figure out how much you're willing to pay for it in, in sample size. So, you know, to the degree that mitigating those two risks are important, then, you know, you do need to calculate, you know, sort of your sample size beforehand. If you're just, if you have reason to believe, if you're not really running a test, and you just want to make some sort of decision, you can, you can make whatever decision you want. Um, but you just won't have those, those error, error guarantees. Now, if your question is really, um, really about sequential, is your question really about sequential tests versus sort of fixed size tests? Is that, is that what you're asking about? Nope. Just asking question? if you're, if you're going to run a test and you do care about error and you care about statistical significance, um, somebody, there's some really bad background noise folks. If you're not on mute. Please. Yeah, I don't think it's me. No. Uh, but, but again, it's it's not about it's not significant. It's really about at what levels do I want to mitigate? Given that there's no effect, what levels do I want to mitigate? Making taking an action, believing that there is an effect, or and conversely, if there is an effect, um, at what level do I want to mitigate the risk of not taking the action because there is an effect, and I believe there isn't. That, that's the whole reason why you're, you're doing it, is to, is to mitigate those two risks. That's really it. So, you know, if, if that's not what you care about, and which may be fine, um, then, you know, whatever. Make, make, you know, you can be more ad hoc about it. Yep, that's, that's totally fair. All right, Tim. Well, this is my second time that you had me on a panel and the second time that I'm uh, not really that qualified. <laughs> So, so I actually want to, can I actually ask a question instead of, uh, Absolutely. it's kind of a follow on to, and this is because I, I think I, a year ago would have just come to it saying, well, I need to calculate a sample size that intuitively makes sense. I need to go to any old calculator. They're all going to spit up the same results and have kind of slowly learned that there are various levers that we can pull for various reasons. But to that question about not calculating sample size, I mean, one way to not calculate it would be to just say, I'm going to run this test for 10 days. I'm not going to calculate what that gives me. I'm not going to actually figure out what that means. I'm just going to take that 10 days worth of data and I'm going to make a decision on it. Is that um, after I, after the fact, and this is, I'm assuming one of the other three guys' head will explode, is that after the fact then say, well, based on what I collected, this is how much of type two or type one I can, I can mitigate. Is that just sloppy or um, is, that a, is that a legitimate way to approach? Matt, do you wanna, do you wanna take that one or, or I can answer that? Uh, Chad, you can go ahead and, and if you want, I can follow up. Okay, so, so you, can, you can do that. Um, you can if you say so if you say for example um, uh, I have some some change that I want to make I'm just going to make that change and I'm gonna let it run for like you said 10 days so one of the requirements is you do need to have some significance threshold so you need to have some boundary where you're making a decision like at this point this is what we're going to accept is is uh, something we, we either want to implement or that we're not going to implement and the statistics are not going to change so it's not going to change whether you calculate out a sample size and it tells you you need to run it for 10 days or you don't calculate out a sample size and it, and it 
obviously you don't, it doesn't tell you anything. So at the end of that 10 day period, you're going to get a result. You're going to get some P value that's saying, okay, this is, we, we calculated your results. We see some lift or we see no lift at all. And then this is the significance level that you observe. So, and, and then that's fine. So if, if it's below that significance threshold you've set, so if it's like say 0 0.01 or something like that, then that's a legitimate implementation. The issue with doing that is that you're not, um, that's kind of where we get into, into business goals, right? There's a, there's a risk involved. And the risk is, I don't know what lift I need to see in order for it to be, signif for, for it to be significant in the first place. So maybe without doing my sample size calculation, if I had done it in the first place, I would have realized that in order to get a significant value or what I think is a, uh, enough to be a significant value, I would need 10% lift. And for the test that I'm making, let's just say changing the color of a button, maybe that's not feasible if I'm like a billion dollar business. So what's just happened is I've wasted 10 days of time because the statistical calculation, the sample size calculation would have told me in advance that this is probably not going to happen in the time limit that I, I expect it will. Oh, that, that totally makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you're potentially wasting resources and time on a test when you could have done some pretty quick traffic volume and kind of qualitative assessment of, wow, is this going to require me to have eye popping unrealistic results and that's unlikely. So I need to rethink whether I should do the test, figure out a way to run it longer. So it's basically a way to give me input to the planning, even though, which still ultimately gets to a sample size, even if I'm backing into it from a different direction. That's right. It's decision making and prioritization. It's more than just making sure you can get your results in your um, designated um, amount of time. It's also um, or, or that you can get a lift if you go back historically and you look at all the tests that you've run that were similar in nature or maybe just all the tests that you've run and you say, you know, hey, our average lift is, is 5% and I, you know, I, it would take me six months to see any kind of statistically significant results um, for this test at that level. And, and then you go and you look at the test and you say, hey, is this lift even feasible? Wasted resources is what we're trying to avoid. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think it's more than that. I think it's, it's, it's thinking, I mean, it is, yes, it's that, but it's, 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 the, the test is not the, the upfront part of the problem. The, the part of the problem is specifying the, the, the marginal value of taking some sort of action. So, and if you can't be bothered to figure out like what's important or you don't have some sort of assessment of what the value would be with respect to some level of improvement and, and sort of are willing to pay some sort of cost to mitigate that risk. Uh, you're, I think, it, I, I think you're, 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 you're at risk of turning the, the whole testing framework into uh, some sort of ritual or theater. Like, the, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't, why wouldn't you calculate, figure out what the samples like, I mean, the whole, the whole point of this is to think about making a business decision. We're making decisions under constraints and it's a resource allocation problem always. And you're trying to get, you're trying to make decisions with some sort of um, guarantee in expectation about your risk to mitigate that. That's, that's why you're, that's the whole point of doing any of this. If you're not, if you don't really care about it or you haven't even really thought about what any of that means, then maybe don't even bother and just, you know, be kind of ad hoc about it. You know, I mean, it, I just think it's important to frame the, be able to frame the problem, to find the problem first, and then you can run a test to assess, um, you know, to kind of put it through some sort of stringent um, possibility for rejecting our hypothesis. You, it's like a filter or a, a screen. So, but, you know, I would just keep that in mind. Like the, the whole point of this is really to think about the business problem up front. And then to, to Kelly's point is to, so that you're not wasting your resources. And, it, you know, I'm going to throw this out here. I, and I don't, I've never actually tried to use this interface, but it, for those of you um, on the Zoom, um, there is a, a little yes, no, go slower, whatever mark in the participants panel. So I'm going to ask a question. 
uh, hopefully I'm not leading the witness here, but how many of you have been in a situation where you or a colleague said, let's run this test until it reaches significance or confidence? I've got five yeses so far. Six. Ooh, somebody said no. I'm impressed. Where's the little clicker? <laughs> um, since I'm sharing screen, I can't see where it is for you. Tim, can you see it? Um, yeah, yes. if, you, if, you, if you hover over the bottom of the panel and click on participants so the participants panel, panel shows up, then it's kind of at the bottom of that screen. 13. 13 to one so far, 14 to one. So as people are answering that question, let me ask our statisticians, why is that dangerous? And if nobody uses the word p-hacking, I'm going to be really disappointed because Ellie had me read a lot about it. Am, am, I, right, am I right in thinking that that actually wasn't something that was, that, that in kind of, early days of mass a b testing platforms out there that there was even the vendors were kind of saying look you can kick this test off and then watch it right and then That's they kind of us. Track. we never said that well. <laughs> conductrix <laughs> never said that you never said that <laughs> some people did some people didn't did. it, it certainly didn't help our sales in saying that you couldn't do that since everyone else was saying that you could but you know, we never said that Pretty much yeah. so all are still saying that, by the way. Are they? Well, I, I think they've changed. I think it's been, I think they've, they've gotten some pushback, maybe in, maybe in sort of like the um, like late 2000s, maybe early 2010s, people were sort of still, there was that narrative kind of existed. But sort of the, the way that I, I, I think about that, um, that p-hacking uh, problem that you mentioned, which is more used in like the scientific community when yeah. you're talking about papers and things like that, but it's, it's the same problem. Um, I, I kind of think of it in terms of um, flipping coins and expectations when you're flipping coins. It's kind of easy to visualize that way. Um, everything that is done, if there's a, a known possibility to it, you know, right, there's, there's some probability. So if I flip a coin and I'm interested in a particular outcome, like getting heads, then from a single flip, that, that probability is going to be 50%, right? There's two options. I flip it once, then there's a 50% chance I get heads. But as soon as I flip my coin two times, then the chance of me getting at least one heads goes from 50% to 75%. And the reason that happens is because I don't have two options anymore. Now I have four options. It's the four possible outcomes that that coin can take. It could be heads and heads, heads and heads, or tails and ta tails, or heads and tails, or tails and heads. It's three out of four that contain heads. And the same thing happens um, when you're making a whole bunch of uh, observations. So when you're running a test, the idea is if there's no difference at all, so that's the null hypothesis that we assume is true when we start an experiment. If the null hypothesis is true and there's no difference, then every time we look at our test, it could be a potentially random result, right? It could be fluctuating. A could be higher than B or B could be higher than A. So the more observations that we're making, the higher likelihood it is that we're going to observe an error. So one of the, the easiest ways to think about it is that every test, every test that is ever run is going to hit significance at some point. Um, because really all we're looking at is that p-value and a p-value threshold of 0 0.05 or less. And that p-value threshold is essentially stating by random chance, this is the p-value would, we would observe. We would observe it 5% of the time. So random chance, we open up our experiment, we might observe a p-value of 0.2 and then 0.8 and then 0.7 and then 0 0.03. We stop it and we say, okay, it's good to go. It turns out it's just random chance because we observed it so many times we eventually got that error rate. Not good. Not good. Does, does that mean that you're calculating a sample size not just to get your minimum sample, but also to give you some, like if you, if you calculated a sample size and it said you needed 4,000 observations per group, does, and you said, well, hey, I've got so much data, I'm going to pull 40,000. Um, are you also looking at the sample size to not collect too much data that potentially could drive you to seeing reporting significance or no? 
Well, not not quite. So there is there is a, there is a way. I think the the issue with collecting too much data is really in more of an opportunity cost type situation, which is wasted time. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've I've wasted my time. But if you've set your significance threshold in advance, and that's sort of the other value of setting your setting your sample size, because what you're doing is you're saying I want to take one point in time, one singular point in time, and I'm going to use that one point to make my decision. And what that error rate is, that, that 0.05 error rate that we talk about, that significance level of 95%, what we're really saying is that for every one observation we make, we have a 5% chance of that being just due to, to random chance. Gen generally speaking, it means something a little bit different than that, but that's kind of the idea. So we're picking a, a single point in time, that way we know we fall within the error rate that we've we've set for ourselves. That single point in time could be in three days, it could be in a week, it could be in two months, it could be in three months, but as long as we pick a single point in time, our error rate stays the same. If we're picking multiple point in, points in time, that's where that error inflation starts to happen, like I mentioned with the coin example. So don't peak. <laughs> but we all know we're gonna peak, but don't make a decision. Right, peaking's okay. But making a decision because you've been peaking, you've peaked 10 times in a row and now it's significant. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, make, or make a decision, but then you're just, just know that your, your error guarantees are, are not guaranteed anymore. You know, I mean, you, you, you're no longer running the test. For, but if you have some sort of outside business reason where you've got to, you know, whatever, there's, there's something that you're concerned about, um, just know though that this is the, that significance value which is really you know and your power level which is what you're what you're running the test to um you know running the test to those to those levels just it won't you won't be able to interpret it that way so you will you will change and you will you will make more slack your your constraints on non mitigating those errors but you know I mean, there are sequential ways of doing of doing testing, and I think some of the vendors do that as well. I think that's they basically use Wald's um, was it sequential ratio test or yep. sequential probability ratio test, and that's really just a way of kind of um, basically doing a rank order of the. Um, anyway, there's there's there are sequential tests that one can run. But those have their own those issues. So it's not always the case if you're just running a test that you have to use the, a fixed approach. There are sequential methods, um, but those those come with their own trade-offs. But you should be using a sequential method if you're going to be if you're going to be doing early stopping. All right. So I have three scenarios that I want to go through using uh, the sample size calculator that Tim created. And then I still want to have time to solicit feedback from everybody regarding what changes need to be made for 2.0. So with that in mind, Tim, I'd like to pass over the screen share to you if you wouldn't mind pulling up. Uh, let's start with the, the regular calculator. Okay, you need to stop. I think I can't grab it yep. until you stop sharing. There you go, sir. Alrighty. Where to put it? There we go. Beautiful. Um, any way to make your screen bigger? Yep. yep. I figured I'd wait until we could view. So while you're doing that, I'm going to talk through the scenario and for the rest of our panel, please, you know, interrupt, add to the scenario, whatever you need. Um, but our, our first scenario, um, we're business. Okay. Uh, we need to improve KPI by at least 5%. Let's say it's, let's just go with like lead generation. Um, I have a lead gen business. I have um, a uh, paid search campaign that's driving to a particular page. Um, let's say that that particular page drives a 20% lead generation rate. And um, I have done the math and I know that this new thing that we want to do with this page costs a certain amount of money. So I need the, the new thing to outperform the existing page by at least 5% in order to pay for the new technology. 
So we have a lift of 5%. Let's say we've got 120,000 visitors over 30 days on average. And we're just going to run this for two um, variants. The, the next decision we have to make is one-tailed versus two-tailed. And this is, you know, growing in um, necessity and popularity and conversations. And I cannot count how many blog posts um, related to conversion rate optimization and one-tailed versus two-tailed that I have read and how many people I've talked to, all the panelists included. Um, I finally found a resource that was super helpful that was actually a meta-analysis of uh, market research done over the past 20 years. And what they found is that people are erroneously choosing two-tailed uh, over one-tailed because they think it's more conservative and therefore safer. But in fact, the decision of one-tailed versus two-tailed is based solely on your hypothesis. If your hypothesis is directional, meaning you expect B to outperform or underperform A, you use one-tailed. If your goal is only to say that B or to evaluate if B is different than A, you use two-tailed. And frankly, in optimization, conversion rate optimization, if you're testing something and you don't have an idea of direction, you probably shouldn't be testing it. So almost every case that I could come up with, you're going to use one tailed. So we give you the option here. I'm going to have a big blog post explaining it further. But for now, we're going to keep it at one tailed. And I know that I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail. And I'll talk to you guys about that after the fact. So now let's move on to confidence. And as referenced earlier, uh, confidence is how you control for your false positives, or another way of saying that, it's how you control for the possibility that your test will tell you that there's a difference when there really isn't. So in this case, we need it to be a 5% uh, improvement. And if we have it set at 95%, which I think that's where it is, that means that 5% of the time, it will tell us that we have statistical significance when we don't. The question is, how much does that matter to us right now? And since we're talking about potentially rolling out something that doesn't have as the lift that the tool is telling us, I think it's kind of important. So we're going to leave that really high at 95%. We could potentially even go higher. But for now, we're going to leave it at 95%. Now let's talk about power for a second. Power is the, um, the statistics, the tools, the tests ability to see a difference if one exists. Um, there's a couple of different analogies that I really like. My favorite right now is a telescope or a microscope. How well you can see small differences is the power. So the higher the power, the easier it will be for the statistics to see a true difference in the noise. So in this case, we really, if, we, if we're going to test, we should increase the power because we want to make sure that we can see it. So let's increase that power to let's do 90% or 95. I don't really care. Okay. Let's do it. 95%. Perfect. All right. So now we see, if we scroll down, that we need 35,000 visitors per variation. We have two variations, and we know our, how many uh, visitors we have in a, in a given month. That means that we would need 18 days to run this test with mitigating risk, as we've just said. Now, one important thing here, 18 days is not in full weeks. That's why I had you up it to 95 there. Um, so my recommendation is actually to increase it to three full weeks unless you do not have a difference in uh, your days of week or time of days uh, for running your test. But if we ran the test to this amount, three weeks or 35,000 visitors per variation, we should have 95% confidence with 95% power in our results if they are at least 5%. Then we have mitigated the risk of being wrong. We've mitigated the risk of missing something. Um, and this gives us greater confidence that when, if, if we have that win, that when we roll it out, it is actually going to pay for the cost of the difference. Does this make sense to everybody? I'm going to take that as a yes. 
because everybody's quiet. Now I want to go to a different example because the example I just gave you is actually fairly uncommon. It's the one that makes the most sense statistically, but it's not what I see in the business world. So Tim, would you flip over to the runtime calculator while I start this scenario? So in scenario two, you don't know or care about the cost of the new implementation if it wins, but you do know how much time you have. So in this scenario, we're going to have a baseline conversion rate of, uh, where did I write that down? Um, let's keep it the same. So we got 20 percent and we still have 120,000 visitors per variation and in this case we know we have 21 days to get an answer maybe there's maybe you're going into your peak season and there's going to be a code freeze um, if you're into it maybe you just have a limited amount of time to to learn really quick and then roll out your winners in time for your peak season whatever the scenario is you have this amount of time but in this scenario, we know that our baseline conversion rate is 20%. We know that um, we know that um, we have 21 days, we've got 120,000 visitors, but we have three tests we want to run. So now we're gonna use this calculator, not just to calculate sample size, but to make some prioritization decisions. So in all three cases, we're just going to keep it at one tailed. Again, we can talk about that later in more depth. Maybe that's a whole conversation by itself. But let's talk about um, the first test is in the upper funnel. And the conversion rate currently for the upper funnel is actually 3%. Because the, it's at the top of the funnel, right? Now, um, we, for confidence... Confidence, remember, helps you control for the possibility of a false positive. But there is no cost to rolling out this change higher than the cost of creating the test. Maybe it's a new banner or whatever. You've already created it. If you roll it out, you're not going to hurt the business. Do you care if the test falsely tells you that it's better when, in fact, it's no different? I would argue you don't. You've already invested the money to run the test in the first place. So we can jack down the confidence. Let's go as low as you're comfortable going. And <laughs> for some people, that may be 50%. We really don't care. For others, maybe it's 80%. I don't care. The point is, it doesn't really matter in this case if you falsely tell them it's a win and you roll it out because you've already spent the money to create the new content, okay? Power, on the other hand, if there's a difference, we want to see it. Why are we testing otherwise? So let's, let's turn that up a little bit. Now we see that there's a minimum lift percentage of 7.5% that you would need in order to run this test over 21 days. We can go back historically. We can look at the average lift um, of all the tests that we've run, and we can say maybe the average lift is 5%, or maybe the average lift for tests on that page is a certain percent, and we can say, mm, this is a little bit of a stretch, and it's on the top of the funnel. Okay, let's check these other tests. So the second test is in the cart, and the conversion rate in the cart is 12%. I know all of you are like, wow, that'd be great, but let's say it's 12%. So it's 12%. We still have 120,000 visitors. We still have 20 days. We leave everything else the same because it's the same scenario. And now you see you only need a lift of 3.6% over that time frame. And that would be really easy to achieve because your average lift, if you recall, maybe was 5%. So let's check the fourth test. This one's in the checkout funnel and the, and the conversion rate is 20%. Now you need a lift of 2.6%, piece of cake. What if you could run both the second and the third test? We can check that really quick by halving our traffic volume to 60,000 visitors from 120. 
there we go. It's like, that scared me for a second. 4%. <laughs> so we only need a 4% lift with half the traffic. Now we have two tests we could potentially run simultaneously on split traffic and making sure that there's no interactions. We all know all of those things that we have to consider. But now we've made the most of our available resource, which is time. We have 21 days and we have 120,000 visitors. How do we want to use that time and that limited resource? This tool should help you get there. It can also help you make decisions about, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, Tim, so you can see a little bit further. A little bit more. There we go. In the left-hand corner on both calculators, you're going to see lift by duration. So you can see how much higher the lift would need to be if you wanted to end the test earlier. On the right side, you can see how much risk you are willing to take for each of the categories. So in the world where there truly is a difference between your challenger and your control, how often are you going to see that difference? If you set power to 95, you're going to see it 95% of the time. 5% of the time, you'll miss it. Okay? In the world where there really isn't a difference, your testing tool might tell you there's a difference 40% of the time if you have it turned down to 60%. That's your confidence level. And again, sometimes if the cost of your implementation is high, you need that confidence level to be really high. But if the comp if the cost of your implementation is not high, having a false positive rate that is higher than 5% may be not that big of a deal. And it's, that's really counter to what most folks are talking about in blogs and across uh, you know, the best practices. So with that in mind, I've shown you guys the calculator. Before I take feedback, I want to ask our panelists, um, our statisticians, does that make you squirm to think about using the tool this way to make decisions or does it make sense? They're, they're quiet. I love this. Go ahead, Matt. I'll be, I'll be the first to bite, but um, I, I think I just have a very uh, instinctual and non-justifiable uh, reason for saying that feels an awful lot like change for change's sake. And uh, whenever you're doing that kind of calculus, there's a lot of invisible costs that you're inevitably not going to be able to take into account. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the costs of user attention being, uh, you know, messing with users' attention, messing That's with the way that people are there. Um, those really small things that you don't tend to think of as, here's a major effect of this test, um, you want to be really sensitive to those kinds of things. So I, again, I, I entirely open to the uh, possibility that this is squarely in my uh, place's opinion, and I don't want to go to a client and tell them, yeah, you should just thrash around wild, wildly on your site because this banner doesn't make a difference anyway. Um, that doesn't feel like a super compelling message to be giving them uh, at the end of yeah. the day. Those, those aren't the tests we should be doing, right? That, that's not our focus. If we, if we don't have evidence supporting a hypothesis that is directional in nature, why are we even testing? Totally agree with you. But in the scenario where you thought it was going to win, and it's actually flat, do we care? I still think so. I, I don't know. It just, it, I, it feels like it, uh, you want to be here. tells us that constant change on the website might have a negative long-term impact on customer experience. Yeah. I, I tend to lean towards always make the intentional change, not the one that just seems convenient, but uh, I'm sure that the other folks have uh, opinions that might contradict that. Yeah, I, I think, I think there, um, I think there is a, a lot of potential use cases where a, a scenario like that would be um, could be used, you know. Um, so one example, maybe if you're if you're building something or you're testing something that is reducing a workload or reducing another set of processes. So for example, let's say that you have um, a hero image on a website, and every quarter or every month or something like that, the marketing team gets together and you, they develop a, a strategy for it. They come up with a new set of creative. They have to talk to an agency. They have to build out copy. And all of those things need to be paid for. Um, well, maybe if you're testing something that requires a lot less work and a lot less effort put into it, um, that's something where you wouldn't really care as much if it was a win. Because even if it's not a loss, it still it still works for everybody and it's reducing the amount of load on on the site in fact there's, there's a name for that type of test it's called a non-inferiority test or an equivalence test 
Um, and in some areas, especially in like medical research, they're really, really common. Um, one, one type of, of sort of experiment that medical researchers do is if they inf invent a new drug, maybe they don't invent a drug that cures a disease faster than the old drug, but they do invent a drug that costs less. And so what they want to figure out is if the drug is, as long as it's not worse, as long as it doesn't make people, you know, die faster or cure the disease uh, slower or something like that, then it's great. So I think that's a, a just a use case that could and work. Kelly, are you, are you going to share, so Chad had shared an article that actually kind of explains the, the non-inferiority um, and kind of how that's a little bit of a different way to view things. That may be worth kind of sharing out as well. Absolutely. Chad, if, um, if you have it, you please put it in the uh, TLC Slack. Oh, sure. I remember it was in an email from him. So, yeah. so what, what was the question? The question is, is about reducing the confidence about, level. Is that the issue? Eh, that's part of it, but it's more about using typically sample size calculators historically have been used just to decide how, how much traffic do I need? Um, go run the test um, or maybe just to check a box and say you've done it. And we're Tim and I, as we look at this, it's more about decision-making and prioritization and um, you know, really understanding how adjusting the various levers impacts your risk and your runtime and the required lift, that sort of, that sort of calculus that, that maybe some analysts are already doing in their head, but this puts it in a visual um, uh, format that allows you to potentially better communicate it to your stakeholders. So I guess the question is, is you know, what do you guys think about using it that way? as opposed to just deciding how long to run the tests. So I think I, personally, I, I think that it's, it's something that's, I think it's a, it's a good alternative way of looking at things because I mean, this is, I think this is more business, business focused. Um, I mean, kind of a, a reality I think, especially of smaller businesses um, is that your limitations are going to be in uh, well, actually, let me let me switch that and reverse it. Limitations of of larger uh, businesses um, are, are going to be more along the lines of of time and opportunity cost. So, you know, I need to. Sometimes there are some businesses that have experimentation programs that uh, work in terms of uh, sprint cycles and releases and things like that. And so it might be, hey, you know, we have a release every month, and so we want to make sure that this test is done within this time period so that the next test can proceed after it. You know, there are some, I think there are some, there are a lot of constraints in, in certain areas. And I think something like this would be a good way at least to get an understanding of what your, what your options are. I think MDEs, um, I think there's a lot more that goes into establishing an MDE, like when you're sort of thinking about um, cost and, and stuff like that. But I think that most people don't think about what goes into MDE at all besides... Uh, exactly. Besides the same, they just, the idea is just, let me just come up with a random number. I'll say 3%. Well, why 3%? Well, because, I don't know, 3% sounds good. So at least right. this, is, this is a way of quantifying what your MDE should be based on something. Yep, yep. Uh, Matt, before you jump in, um, I've got a question on the Slack that, that you might be able to answer. Uh, with higher sample sizes, the t-test approximates a normal distribution. Um, are there any scenarios or advantages where it's better to look at a z-score or confidence level? Um, you know, I'll, I think I'm going to throw that back as a homework assignment for everybody. And, and I know that sounds like a joke, but I actually do think it's, I mean, there's a million calculators. So just take different scenarios and, um, and we can send out some, some online tools to the, to the group. But just go and do some simulations and take a look and see for yourself where it starts making a difference. At any, I, at any reasonable sample size that you might use online, right, for our online test cases, um, it's, it's almost never going to matter. I, I mean, I guarantee you if you run, um, you know, a t-test versus a proportional z-test, or something, or some sort of chi-squared test, which is, you know, sort of square of Z, 
um, you're going to get this, you're going to get essentially the same result and it will be exactly the same result. The, I mean, the T statistic or the, the, the statistic that you get out will be at, um, you know, two or three significant digits will be exactly the same of, of any appreciable size. And so as a, a good sort of rule of rule approximation, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, you, 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 the, the, the lower bound on how long you should run the test is, is, is your sample size, but then also a good approximation is just n times p, the minimum of n times p or n times one minus p. Just make sure that's greater than 10 as a good conservative estimate. And then your, your test using the normal distribution is fine. Because remember that the, the, the normal distribution is around your estimate, not from the population right? It's not the population standard deviation, or it's not the population distribution, excuse me, that you care about. It's the sampling error. And so the sampling error, due to the central limit theorem, will become approximately normal, um, especially when n times p or n times 1 minus p uh, is greater than 5 or 10 or whatever. Or just go check, just muck about, and you'll get a good feel for when it's going to matter. And if you're looking at sample sizes of at least 1,000, it's not going to matter, but don't, you don't have to take my word for it. Go, go play around and you'll see where it starts making a difference. You said it was going to be homework, but then you gave the answer. No, I mean, no, the, the homework himself. is to do, no, the homework is to go see maybe, I mean, if you're only looking at, you know, samples of 15, then yeah, it might make a difference, but it's, that's crazy. Anyway, like any, in any, any part of the problem space that you would be rational to be considering, it's not going to matter. But again, you don't have, it, it's, it's something that you can just discover. And in fact, it's just good to get a, you'll get a better feel for how all this works just by plugging in numbers into those, it's those various calculators. And, and we can send out a list, we, we, you know, I can send some stuff out and Kelly can, Absolutely. can pass it around and just, just, just play around with it. And then it'll be less foreign anyway, but I, I don't think it matters, but others may disagree. Actually, I was just going to add on to, to Matt's point really quick because I mean he's ex exactly right, and I think I think something sometimes sometimes if you're if you're first starting to look at like the statistics of experimentation and you're kind of getting into that world, there's a lot of uh, terms and there's a lot of tests and all these other different things. One thing you got to remember is that these started for for very small sample sizes, so these started in fields like you know psychological research and, and, and clinical research where there was a cost getting every single person in your sample. And agriculture. And, and agriculture. Resource economics. Yeah, it, exactly. Like is there, there was a cost associated with that. So it was, it was hard to get a hundred people. It was hard to get sometimes to get 50 people. And so these techniques are, are more focused around that reality. We don't live in that world, right? We can get thousands and thousands of people for free, pretty easily. I mean, it's free as, as it costs for acquisition. Um, so there are some of the differences, some of the, the issues that may apply other places don't necessarily apply to us. Absolutely. We have two minutes left. So um, I'm going to encourage folks, if you have thoughts and feedbacks about changes you'd like to see or new calculators totally different that you'd like to see, Tim is eager for the work. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to give you two that we've received already, um, and, and I mean, if you have more that you want to build off of them, but one is a, a continuous metric like revenue or time. So if you want to do RPV or time on site, um, how will we calculate sample size for that? Um, and um, what was the second one, Tim? Well, the whole oh. handling multiple variations and correcting. Yes, controlling for multi multiple variation error. Um, and both of those things are you know, being considered and in, in, in the works. But if you have other things or specific things about those things um, that you'd like to ask for, uh, reach out through email or the TLC Slack um, or, you know, just start pinging Tim. He loves it. You know, just send him all of your ideas. <laughs> well, well and, I, and I would just, I would say part of, part of what we were trying to do was with the visualizations was trying to improve some of that or provide some of that intuition, as Matt was saying, kind of with experimenting with it. Yep. So if you have ideas for visualizations, there are some that are no longer included because they, we thought they worked and then they didn't. Um, so I would encourage, please provide that as well. If you say this totally doesn't work or it might work better this other way, or you could visualize, you know, something 
uh, that's kind of my selfish excuse is to develop that intuition by, uh, through visualization. Absolutely. So I really, really appreciate our panelists. Thank you guys, uh, Matt, Chad, Matt, Tim. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. And I know that the, the topic isn't sexy, but it is important and it's um, too often uh, not discussed. And I really appreciate everybody for joining. I hope you guys got as much out of it as I did. Um, there are some links to the calculators that I just put in the TLC Slack calls channel. I'll also send it out with the notes. Um, please dive in, play with it, send us your feedback, send us thoughts, questions, whatever. Um, and again, you will also get a link for prioritizing future topics. So thanks everybody. Have a great weekend.